Okay, so it's uh, just five after four. Um, I think we're gonna get going. Uh, someone just kindly came up to me and said, don't worry about the numbers in here because there's lots else going on, but I just said this number is perfect for me, so. <laughs> but we'll keep the door open at the back uh, just as people come in. Um, but we have until five. I'm not planning to take an hour, so hopefully we'll have lots of time for Q&A at the end. Um, So let me just, I guess, begin by thanking you guys for having me here today. Um, my colleague, uh, Alexios Mansurlis, who's the director of the International Fact Checking uh, Network, which is at the Pointer Institute, was unable to be here, but I'm happy to be his Canada-based uh, minion here instead. So my name is Dana Wagner, and I'm the co-founder and editor of FactScan, the Canadian political fact checker. Uh, and. Uh, like I said, there's going to be, I'm not going to take up the hour, there'll be lots of time for Q&A at the end, and really please interrupt me with questions um, as we go. So I'll just begin by quickly telling you a little bit about uh, us at FactsCan. So we're a nonprofit, we're independent and we're nonpartisan, and we focus on Canadian federal politics. Uh, so we've been operating since February 2015, which um, was the lead into the last federal election. Uh, and we rate checkable claims on a scale of true, misleading, and false. We also have a score of farcical and withholding judgment, but we tend to deploy those two scores more sparingly. Um, but today, really what I'm gonna talk about uh, is bigger than FactScan and it's bigger than Canada. Uh, it's about the past year in fact checking. Um, and I'm gonna give you a bit of a lay of, a, a lay of the land of what's been happening globally, because it's really been uh, a very interesting year. So I think everyone's probably familiar by now with the, the, the phrase that we're in a post-truth era. Um, I certainly reject this idea, and I think a lot of you guys uh, here would too. Um, I really think that fact-checking is as relevant as ever. Uh, I think that kind of the, the casual relationship with facts that we've seen over the past year or two, uh, combined with the ease of spreading misinformation, makes it really critical that we're exploring new ways of catching uh, false information, that we're exploring new ways of correcting it, and especially disseminating that. Um, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but I'll really keep the focus on three areas, which is our understanding of how fact-checking works, so what the research tells us about our impact in fact-checking, um, some of the types of problems that we're, that we're seeing, especially how and, and why misinformation is spreading, and some of the ways that fact-checkers globally are, are kind of tackling these newer problems. So to begin, does fact-checking work? Uh, what is our impact? And I think this is a good place to begin because we actually do know something about this. We have a very good idea of what happens when humans uh, meet facts. Uh, and one important study that was published earlier this year uh, tells us a lot about the way that we process political misinformation uh, and corrections. So before I explain to you what's happening here in this graph, the main takeaway from this study is that fact-checking changes our minds and our beliefs but not our votes. So this is still a very good and positive finding. Um, so what these researchers did here, Swire Thompson and, and her colleagues, uh, they worked with just over 2,000 participants and they got them to rate um, four factual statements by Donald Trump and four inaccurate statements. Uh, and they got these participants to rate their belief in these statements on a scale of zero to 10. So zero being, I don't believe, 10 is, is I believe. Um, so some examples of the inaccurate ones included claims that like employment in the US is as high as 42%, that vaccines cause autism, like those types of inaccurate claims. Um, participants were then asked, after they were asked to, to, to uh, rate their belief, they were shown corrections um, or, or confirmations if it was a true statement, and they were asked to rate their belief again. So here's where, um, if I could just ask you to look at the, the lines on the bottom of the graph here, these are the, the um, inaccurate statements, and you'll see that if, if someone scored their initial belief uh, at around like four or five, after they were shown a correction, they expected how we want people to behave, how we expect them to, and, and kind of rationally how we, we think humans should behave after shown a correction, is that their belief in that um, incorrect statement decreased. Now the interesting thing that the researchers found was that the, the effect of this was more pronounced in the immediate. So they also tested people's beliefs in the same statement one week later and found that there had been a bit of a movement back to the initial belief, 
um, not huge, and this is something that the researchers has, have said they're going to continue testing, but there still is a, a, a drop in that belief, so this overall is a good thing, that facts do change people's beliefs. And a, another interesting um, thing that these researchers found was that partisan preference didn't matter. So you have the same um, ability to correct your belief, whether you were a Democrat, whether you were a, a Republican who supported Trump, or whether you were a Republican who supported like another candidate. So again, that's a very positive finding. So another uh, thing we know about fact checking is that it does not backfire. And I'm curious here, has, if you could just show me sh with a show of hands, has anyone here heard of the backfire effect? Okay, so a few people. Okay, perfect. Um, so for those of you who, didn't know, who don't know what backfire is, this comes from a pretty significant study on the relationship between facts and partisan belief. Uh, and this study on backfire was done by Brendan uh, Nian and Jason Reifler, and this was in 2010. And this study of theirs focused on a single issue. And what they did was kind of similar to the previous study, they tested participants um, uh, on a statement about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And these were conservatives who they tested. And after showing uh, these participants the fact that in Iraq there were no weapons of mass destruction, what they found was that after this correction, people actually believed more in the fact that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, so they found that fact checking didn't improve understanding, it reinforced mistaken beliefs, hence backfire. And this was cited way too many times. We took it as fact, we re-examined really like how we were operating, uh, funders were questioning whether fact checking was working, so it was a pretty depressing study. But uh, enter these two other researchers, Porter and Wood, um, and what they did, uh, Ethan Porter and, and Thomas Wood, they tried to replicate this study, and they couldn't. They could not replicate backfire. And so again, before I decide to explain what's going on here, um, what they did was they tested a much larger particip participant group of over 8,000 people, and they tested across 36 different topics, uh, and they really tried to find backfire. So they were looking at statements not just from Trump, they were looking at controversial um, Democrats, controversial Republicans, more neutral ones across the political spectrum, and the results are graphed here. So you'll see the uncorrected claim on top uh, decreases in belief score once corrected. And this, again, is regardless of ideology, which is across the x-axis here. So whether you're liberal, middle of the pack, or conservative, again, people are behaving rationally. Their belief in untrue statements decreases. So overwhelmingly, there's no backfire. And this tells us, again, that people are influenced by factual information, even when it challenges their like, previously held partisan commitments. And I like this quote from Ethan Porter, one of these researchers. So again, talking about this common perception that we're in a post-truth political era, that the American public is immune to factual information. We conducted study after study. We found that no one was exhibiting backfire across any issue. So what about the politicians? Does fact-checking work as a deterrent? We definitely need more research on this question. As far as I'm aware of, there's only one kind of supply-side analysis. Uh, and this was a study that was done back in 2013, and interestingly, it was done by the same researchers who did backfire, uh, Nian and Reifler, but they're actually quite respected academics as well. So this study that they uh, conducted, they sent um, letters to, I think it was about 1,200 uh, state legislators in the U.S., and these letters reminded the state legislators about fact-checking and reminded them about the reputational impacts of fact-checking and if they had their credibility question, what that might do to their reputation. And they found that the legislators who uh, got these letters versus ones who didn't and ones who got like a placebo letter were more likely to score better on accuracy indicators. And that was measured um, through various ways, one of which was like whether they had a claim uh, in the coming year that was questioned by PolitiFact or Washington Post or other fact checkers. So again, this is promising. It shows that politicians really do pay attention. Now, there's also the question of how politicians behave after the fact. And really, I haven't seen any studies here. Um, so after a claim has been uh, debunked, what do politicians do? Do they correct themselves? And here, we just, I think, really have anecdotes at this point. But they're fun to go through. <laughs> so what I did was uh, I asked some fact checkers just um, it, globally about 
what they thought some of their most significant fact checks have been over the past year. Uh, and consistently, they forwarded me some of their work that had prompted a politician to retract a statement that they had made. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few because really I think they're quite glorious. Um, so first from Doru Lukpaya, which is a fact checker based in Turkey. Uh, this uh, was a check that they just did in December. And this comes from President Erdogan, who was quoting an OECD report. Um, and he said that according to this OECD report, Turkey is now a high income country. But Erdogan took that information um, from a newspaper, and the editor of the newspaper in Turkey had actually misinterpreted the OECD report. And what it did was project four scenarios for the future. For 2030, what would happen? And in only one of those scenarios was Turkey going to be a high-income country. So they corrected this, uh, and Erdogan actually retracted it. And he came out and said, you know what, Turkey might become a country that is high-income in 2030, if all goes well. Uh, this example here comes from Pagella Politica in Italy, um, and they had a great segment in the spring where they actually had on uh, national TV the former uh, Prime Minister Matteo Renzi, who you see here with his back uh, towards us. And so he was on one of their live fact-checking episodes, uh, and Pagella debunked a claim of his on live TV in front of him. Uh, and this claim was that during his tenure as Prime Minister, um, the scale of GD GDP growth in Italy uh, was unheard of. So he claimed that it was a scale that was larger than seen across the entire Eurozone. And this was in fact not true. There were precisely five other countries that had a larger leap than Italy, uh, Spain, Ireland, Cyprus, Slovenia, and Greece in that period that he was uh, PM. So it was just like a fascinating episode to watch him kind of cringe uncomfortably in the chair, uh, but he corrected himself. He actually did something interesting though, and I think a lot of politicians do this, and it's something interesting that we have to watch. Uh, he started saying like, okay, you know, I stand corrected, but you know, Italy really can't be compared to those other countries because they came from a much deeper slump beforehand. So, you know, essentially what he did was, apart from those five countries that proved me wrong, I'm right. And, and it kind of went on from there. But anyways, he, he changed the parameters, but he still corrected the record. Uh, and finally, just one from uh, Lupa, Lupa uh, in Brazil. Uh, they caught, this is a more recent one, they caught a series of contradictory statements um, by the ex-president, uh, Cardoso, who really remains uh, still very influential in Brazil. Uh, and he had for a long time supported the current president, Michel Temer. Um, and after these series of contradictions um, that Lupa exposed, just about kind of his wavering support for some things that the government was doing, uh, Cardoso publicly changed his position of support for Temer. Uh, and this was really the first time that he came out and publicly did this. Um, and I don't know if anyone knows, but Temer currently is um, being accused in a pretty large scale way of corruption in Brazil. And so this loss of support was a pretty significant uh, hit to him. Now, Moving on to the second topic, and I'll return to some examples, but I want to just quickly talk about some of the problems that we're facing, um, and in particular, some of the problems that have been kind of rampant over the past year. And a lot of this really circles back to fake news. And I can't take credit for spelling it this way. This comes from a colleague. But I think it really reflects that fake news, it, like, it, it is an awful term. And I think that's because like, it's not precise. Um, and we've also really seen it be deployed uh, by politicians as a way to really undermine the credibility of critical reporting. So what do we mean when we actually say fake news? Um, and others who have spent a lot more time thinking about this uh, have tried to kind of shift our language to talking about misinformation and disinformation. So misinformation is kind of tends to be defined as more inadvertent sharing of, of false information. So what, like you don't necessarily do it deliberately. You might not know you're doing it. You hit retweet, and you're part of that misinformation ecosystem. Um, so even if you remember that early example of President Erdogan in Turkey, right? So he's sharing information that he didn't really deliberately uh, try to mislead people versus disinformation, which would be the more uh, kind of deliberate and really often uh, kind of online, uh, linked and networked form of sharing uh, misinformation, or sorry, false information. And one of the better taxonomies that I've seen for the types of misinformation comes from uh, a colleague at First Draft News, Claire Wardell. Uh, and Claire argues that there are seven different types of, um, of this mis and disinformation. And she puts them on this scale that's kind of, uh, it's loosely measured on here. Uh, 
along a scale of someone's intent to deceive. So you'll see like from satire and parody on the left of, of here, going over through false connection, misleading content, false context, imposter content, manipulated content, and then over to fabricated content um, on the more deliberate end of the scale on the right. And intent here is key um, because it's really linked to the ways that content is created and shared. So for instance, like Claire argues, and I, I, I tend to agree that one of the most concerning forms of misinformation that we're facing are these deliberate campaigns, uh, typically driven by political influence. And these types of campaigns are the, one that we're, the ones that we're seeing, again, linked to like bot networks and troll factories. Um, I probably don't have to tell many of, these peop peop many of you guys here about what these are, but um, if you want to understand more about trolling, I, I point people to, there's, there was a fantastic episode um, uh, by This American Life in, in January that uh, they had interviewed some uh, people at this uh, kind of celebration for, for people who call themselves trolls uh, in the US, and, and one of them was boasting about the fact that they had memed Trump into the White House. So these are fairly coordinated and, and, and sophisticated movements. And uh, part of the reason that they are so dangerously sophisticated is because, I think, of the way that our brains work. Um, so these coordinated and consistent messaging uh, forms really do fool our brains. So with like overwhelming amounts of information out there, like our brains do rely on shortcuts. And when we see multiple messages saying the same thing and reinforcing the same thing, we tend to attribute more credibility to that piece of information. So picture yourself sitting there, seeing the same thing like five, six times throughout the day, you're gonna be more likely automatically to attribute more credibility to, that, to whatever that piece of information is. So how are fact checkers responding to this, this new kind of misinformation environment? Um, and by the way, there are about 126 active fact checkers uh, as counted by the Duke Reporters Lab uh, here. I know there are many more kind of that we would talk about informally, but these are the ones that are a bit more um, kind of formally organized as, as distinct organizations. So I just wanted to touch on about three responses that I think are pretty cool from fact checkers. Uh, some neat forms of collaboration, uh, automation and fact checking, and then standards. So one really neat form of collaboration that we've seen over this past year uh, comes from France, and this was leading up to the French election, um, where media outlets were watching the rise of Marine Le Pen, but not only that, they were watching this really uh, new form of uh, seeing like videos and images deliberately circulated to the public that were completely false, um, often manipulated content. So 17 uh, French media outlets decided to fact check together during the election, so they created this uh, website called Crosscheck, where they would actually publish, decide to publish together instead of um, on like a site like Liberation, they'd publish here on Crosscheck. And you'll see that splash of logos on the side are all the media outlets that had uh, verified this piece of information together. And in, in, so after the election, in a bit of like a post-mortem, some of the journalists were talking about like why they think this worked so well, and, and really there was consensus that this was a very smart way for them to have done business during the election. Um, one, they think readers likely got more coverage when the media outlets were pooling their resources, because they had found that before they created this, they were just completely duplicating their efforts. Like across multiple platforms, they'd be debunking the same videos and just all of those reporters that they'd be putting towards that, obviously only one person could do it, a few others would verify, and they'd all be fine putting their logos on the story. So more coverage, and then second, for, from a reader perspective, like seeing all these competing news outlets kind of put their stamp of approval on the same thing does lend more credibility uh, to the story. So just very briefly again, because these examples are interesting, uh, what this story here is debunking, um, in, in the video, just on the story, you'll just kind of see like a, a freeze frame of the video and what's happening here. This was something that was um, a piece of manipulated content that really mattered in this election campaign. And, and this shows Macron uh, washing his hands. And this initial claim was put out by a Twitter account and it declared that Emmanuel Macron washes his hands after he shakes hands with workers. And it comes from a real video of him actually like using a hand wipe to wipe his hands. Um, but the longer video actually shows him at a separate meeting where he's handling eels 
like literal eels, and then he goes from that meeting into a car and starts wiping his hands. So, it, and it's just interesting because that rumor again like really followed him. So there were subsequent like media interviews with him, um, or just you know at different campaign stops. There was this one notable example um, from a factory, and a woman came up to him, like a, just someone who was working there, and just said, "Oh well, Mr. President, like are you are you good enough to shake my hand?" And and he would be facing this kind of thing constantly, and it all started from this uh, Twitter account. And again, like I, I just like this example because it goes to show just like this manipulated content is a really kind of um, different form of misinformation that we're seeing spread. So in, in a similar vein, like another example of this collaboration comes from Norway and Norway has an upcoming ele election in September uh, and outlets here were really anticipating the same uh, problems that were facing other countries' elections, including France, so manipulated content and, and just other forms of misinformation. And three outlets here, including the two largest online news outlets and the public broadcaster launched, um, I'm gonna get faktisk, uh, which means in Norwegian like factually or actually. And the rationale for, for putting aside competition um, in this instance, like it really wasn't obvious to me. Like you start, I, I'm just trying to picture Canadian news outlets doing that type of thing, and I, to be honest, I can't. So it was interesting to hear the rationale from the CEO, um, Halle Solberg, uh, who, who was quite candid about this. That for a long time, um, herself and she, she's a, a seasoned journalist, and other news outlets really recognized that they were not each other's competitors anymore. That their competitors were actually Facebook and Google and other publishing platforms. Um, and they were competing with just other forms of information, including misinformation. Um, another uh, just kind of, I guess, like innovative way to respond by some fact checkers has been automation. Um, and the leader here, I think, really is full fact in the United Kingdom, uh, which has been developing some neat prototypes. Um, they also put out a report last year with uh, just a, a snapshot of where we are globally with automation. I know the type is small here, um, but this chart comes from that report, which was just released at the end of 2016, um, and they show kind of what's available right now and what's not yet possible, just given our, our current tools. And some of the things that are available right now that are actually being deployed by different fact checkers, including FactScan, um, are tools that monitor claims, um, that can spot specific claims, so not not actually debunk a claim, but actually help us like isol or isolate checkable claims from like really large amounts of text. So if you consider like the Hansard transcripts or like long speeches, we can throw that in um, a tool. Claim Buster, for instance, is one that we use, and it actually gives us claims that, that are verifiable. So that just like, and, and the development of this tool actually comes from MIT in the US, and they had been talking to the founder of PolitiFact and asking like, what do you need? Like, what, what can we help you by building? And his answer was interns. We just don't have enough people to actually go through and like find all the cl like political claims that are out there to help us check. So that's one that we use. Um, and then some very simple checking of claims like with uh, verbatim uh, text and things that have already been kind of checked before. So some things that are not yet possible um, would be spotting claims that are paraphrased, so non-verbatim things. Uh, and definitely like non-text iterations of things, so things that we'd be hearing on radio and TV and that kind of thing. Um, and to just illustrate some of the automation that's happening um, or under development right now, so Full Fact is developing, um, there's one tool called Live that they're developing, uh, and what it would do is work in, in real time to recognize a claim, uh, including on TV or radio, and it would be able to source a structured database and produce a mini analysis. And so really the end user of this type of tool, uh, I've heard them talk about, they, they envision journalists being able to use this. Uh, so the idea is that they'd be instantaneously able to make a better um, judgment as they're listening to something. So if you can picture like a politician being interviewed on live TV and they're talking about anything like poverty for instance, and then you know with the help of something right in front of them like on an iPad or TV, uh, the journalist is able to say, okay, um, we know that there are like two different data sets right now that are very popular to talk about poverty statistics. One tells us poverty is going up, one tells us poverty is going down. Why did you quote the database that you just quoted versus the other one? Tell me about that. And so really it's just trying to cut down the time between a claim being made and some being, someone being able to like instantly rebut it. 
Um, another tool that they're developing is called Trends, which aims to track repetition. Uh, so the claims that have been debunked but are not going away. So really persistent ones. So that vaccines cause autism. Why is that continuing? And, and like who is perpetuating that? Um, the third area here, uh, a bit of a plug for the International Fact Checking Network, but something that I think is, is pretty significant and um, one of the ways to really respond to what's happening right now, because there are a huge number of players, players out there conducting fact checking and fact checking, um, some legit, some not, uh, including politicians that we've seen use those terms as reality check on liberals, blah, 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 reality check on conservatives. Um, and so the philosophy behind standardizing some of the work that we do uh, is that fact checking can be a pretty powerful instrument of like accountability journalism, but if it's biased or if it's partisan, that really starts to undercut everyone's work. Um, and it can have the opposite impact and, and just increase distrust in media in general. Um, so we're now at 29 verified signatories and a number of other fact checkers uh, kind of in the queue in the vetting process. Um, and I'll just end here with uh, kind of some questions about what's next. And these are really open-ended questions, like for us at FactScan and for a lot of our colleagues internationally. Um, one of the interesting things is that we've seen a lot of research out there that people seek out facts that are consistent with their ideology. So we know that people do that. We don't yet know how to intervene. So how do we get, like, that we, we also know that there's a perception out there that uh, fact-checking um, as a form of journalism is more of a left-leaning thing, that it really caters to the audience and that there's a certain agenda. Um, that hasn't been borne out by any uh, research looking at kind of like the uh, types of claims that we check and the scores that we attribute to different folks, but that's still an important perception. So how do we overcome that? There's, there's a philosophy right now that, um, that fact checkers should maybe try to pivot away from the focus that we currently have on politicians. So at FactsCan, what we do right now is we check claims by individuals. So we say, Trudeau said this, false. Andrew Scheer said this, true. What if we're doing ourselves more harm than good? So the idea here would be that the, the alternative would be something called issues-based fact-checking, where instead we say, oh, that's an interesting thing that Trudeau said about wages going up. We're just going to do a fact-check about wages in general. We're not going to attribute to a person. It's going to be about the issue as a way to increase your readership and get over that kind of partisan uh, um, block that might have someone either read a fact check or not, just depending on, on the focus. Another uh, area here is like passive information consumption, so how to outsource the debunking that we do. Um, and this really comes down to, like, uh, I guess it's about skills development and, and should we have a better role in, um, in trying to help people have tools themselves to just increase skepticism, increase critical thinking, and that type of thing. So not necessarily to go independently to source a database, although certainly that would be kind of <laughs> an ideal type of world, but even just to be more skeptical. Like, how do we, how do we teach something called emotional skepticism? And um, one big advocate of this, Craig Silverman, who's the media editor for BuzzFeed, um, has talked about this and just how this seems to be something that we haven't quite understood that well, and we certainly don't know how to tackle where we're not uh, being skeptical of our emotions. So I'm certainly guilty of this. Like if you can picture yourself sitting at home and you read something on Twitter and you're just irate, you read this headline, you're just like, Ugh! it just drives me crazy. And you retweet it and you share it. And the idea would be to instead to just pause and recognize that that might be a trigger for you, like just a really forceful reaction, either positive or negative. Um, and to pause and to be skeptical of, of, of your own emotions. Uh, and then just finally another big topic here, and I would certainly welcome feedback from anyone in this room because this area, to me, these are really big unanswered questions right now in terms of what is the role of the giants out there, Google, Facebook, Snapchat, I was too nervous to put Wikipedia, but Wikipedia, <laughs> what is their responsibility? Um, and some of the things that, that really are up in the air at this point is, like, should, should we be expecting that a platform like Facebook actually remove content? Some content they already are removing, um, some they're not. Uh, 
should we be expecting more help with tracing misinformation? So if anyone out there can do it, can actually trace these little atoms of misinformation that go out there and kind of spin through like uh, networks, like person-to-person person -person connections, because that really is how misinformation is spreading right now. If anyone can trace it, it would be like the Googles of the world. Um, how do we, how, how can fact checkers be enabled that our, connect, our, our corrections can kind of follow that same pathway? You know, should we have help doing this or not? Um, and just to give you an example of like this, this issue of whether to remove content or not, like this is a fact check that we did recently. Um, we checked a petition that the Conservative Party um, has up online on Facebook, which is still up online. And this is about uh, the issue of, I won't go into detail, but just so everyone's on the same page here, Omar Khadr is a, a Canadian citizen, a little bit of a more controversial figure uh, in Canada. He was uh, involved in a disputed firefight, uh, and then he was jailed for the better part of a decade uh, in Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere, uh, and then finally he was um, brought back to Canada, and uh, there has been a settlement that has kind of changed over time, but, uh, or sorry, th there was a, law a civil lawsuit that him and his lawyer launched against the, the Canadian government for alleged participation in his imprisonment and mistreatment in Guantanamo, uh, and this lawsuit was just recently settled by um, the federal government who had been relying on some major Supreme Court decisions in favor of Cotter and just verifying this mistreatment of his as a fact. So whether or not you kind of agree that a settlement should have happened, how large the settlement was, there are just some pure facts in this case. And one thing that this um, petition has, or currently says, is that Omar Khadr didn't apologize, neither should the Canadian government. That's incorrect. So Omar Khadr has apologized. He apologized while he was going through a military um, commission hearing in the United States. He apologized as this settlement uh, was happening uh, just much more recently. So we rated this false. And uh, at the time that we checked this, this petition had over 3,000 likes and had been shared over 600 times. As of yesterday, those numbers had roughly doubled. And so I'll just end here, because this is a problem. So something that we check, it's still up online, and whose responsibility is it? Is it Facebook? Is it Google? Is it the Conservative Party? These are still questions that we really are grappling with right now. So I'll end it here. And with these open-ended questions, I invite your questions now, too. Hello, uh, I just want to say, first of all, I think fact checking is incredibly cool, um, possibly one of my dream jobs. Um, that being said, how are you and or how is your organization trying to reach out to people and organizations who are not otherwise interested in fact checking, who aren't, who are sort of apathetic to whether or not something is true and they're more interested in who has said it? Yeah. Um, yeah, th thank you for that, and I share your passion, <laughs> obviously, for this field. Um, so we certainly are not the leaders here in terms of the outreach that we've done. Um, we've recognized it as a, as a major gap, something that we are looking into, just how to reach people who are outside kind of our um, typical demographic, uh, and we certainly haven't gotten it right. Um, one strategy that we are watching right now is something that PolitiFact in the US is piloting. They just got a pretty big grant to uh, do something that is, is, is kind of like guerrilla fact checking. So they've got, just gotten a big grant to go out into um, more traditionally uh, conservative, smaller communities, uh, especially towns, so not major cities, um, and especially kind of Rust Belt and Southern U US. Um, and what they are planning to do is just uh, hold a lot of consultations, a lot of town halls, a lot of teaching, kind of really the, the basics of, um, of debunking and, and fact checking, and trying to understand if and how uh, they can increase their readership and especially their engagement by um, folks who are outside of their typical readership. And so we're going to be watching the results of that um, kind of pilot project pretty closely to see if there's anything in terms of even even the way that, um, so one of the parts of this project that they're doing, or th th they've brought in some kind of independent consultants to look at the types of words that they use in their, in their fact checks and how things are positioned and portrayed, and if there's anything like a, a, 
I don't know, certain words that, that are more, that Democrats might be more sympathetic to versus Republicans, right? It could be in anything in terms of the presentation and what we're doing. So I think a lot can be learned from things like that, but we certainly haven't cracked this at all. It was interesting that the Norwegian cooperative was of uh, news organizations, which might be for profits. H how in general are these fact checkers funded? <laughs> yes, okay. I don't have the exact figures, but yes, the majority of us, we, we just had, um, so similar to Wikimania, uh, Wikimania, our equivalent of this is called Global Fact, and, and just in July we had Global Fact 4, so it's, we're such a, a nascent industry, we've only had four annual conferences. Um, and we, there was a, a survey that was just done of like uh, everyone's annual budget and where our funding comes from. And the majority of fact checkers annual operating budget is under $10,000. So the majority of the 126 existing uh, fact checkers so are working with very small budgets, meaning a lot of them are, vol are volunteer run, nonprofit. Um, the majority get their funding from foundations. Uh, so it's not user generated uh, revenue or you know other uh, profitable enterprises. But that's not to say that it's not possible. So um, again, PolitiFact is, is really one of the um, pioneers in, in a lot of areas and, and in, uh, in terms of revenue generation as well. Like they just in the last year launched um, a subscription campaign um, and already have made I don't want to get the number wrong, but have made far more than they were initially counting on already just through a user subscription. So it's really shown them that what they're doing, people are actually going to pay for. So I think that there's a lot of ways that we can ex explore different like revenue generation models that we have have not just done yet. Have I did I answer your question properly? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and just to, to quickly touch on here, they're, they're certainly not all um, like that. So the Washington Post, for instance, has kind of a, um, a sidekick fact checker, you know, but, but it's part of its main business. Um, so, you know, there's all different types of models. I wanted to ask you when you first started talking about um, how even correcting a fact doesn't actually change someone's voting going back to that original thing. Um, can you speak, I guess, th there's this uh, hypothesis, right, that over time, um, if your facts are consistently wrong, your authority, your credibility goes down, and it doesn't seem like that's happening, right? Someone can be wrong once or twice, everyone makes mistakes, um, but somehow mm -hmm. this, even with fact checking, are you actually seeing people change their behaviors over time? or their their beliefs in things or their um, perception about whether this is this person is trustable or not. Um, have you seen that kind of play out in fact checking or is that too nascent to see now? So you're not asking me about the behavior of politicians, you're asking me about the behavior of, of the users, of readers and the public. Yeah, I guess I'm interested in that like facts, fact checking is great for like a point in time, but misinformation builds over time. And yeah, so yeah, to correct yeah. misinformation or disinformation, you kind of have to do this at a consistent, ongoing basis so that whoever that person or authority is is no longer viewed as credible. And so have you seen that play out, um, that the effect of long-term fact-checking actually leads to something like that, or is it too soon to see? Yeah, no, excellent question. And, and I think it is de definitely too soon to see. So just. One way to answer this is that um, I didn't really go into in too much detail, but you're right that one, um, the first study that I mentioned just on, uh, that was analyzing solely Trump claims, um, what they found was that yes, fact checking and corrections changes our beliefs, but not our votes. Um, and just kind of one thing to, to say about that is that that's, it sounds depressing, but it's actually not a bad thing because I think that as fact checkers, um, our role is not to change votes, it is to change beliefs. And so I, I don't think that that's a valid end goal for us either. Others may disagree with that, but I think that voting aside, what is more important is, is having informed policy discussions and policy debates. And I think that there can be legitimate and, and complex and 
real policy discussions, um, you know, regardless of which way people are voting, and of course within a party and, and among people who favor different candidates and that type of thing. So if we're contributing to a more informed discussion, to me that is a valid end goal, and we don't have to go, and we shouldn't necessarily want to go further than that and, and, and change votes. Um, in, in terms of what we know about if fact-checking can change votes, it's not necessarily that they found that it couldn't, it's just that the, the research didn't bear that out. So after corrections, people were still unwilling to change their votes, but an interesting thing, and where the researchers in that particular study have said that they want to go further, um, is, is, whether, is if they can show people a more proportionate and realistic um, view of the scale of misinformation put forward by one candidate. So Trump, of course, being the example here, a good example, what they did in this study was show people four statements um, that were factual and four statements that were incorrect. So it's kind of like a balanced picture. And, and that could have influenced the participants' um, voting intentions just by, you know, kind of thinking like, oh, well, on balance, if half are right and half are wrong, maybe that's how all politicians behave, that type of thing. So th that's still an unanswered question if there's a more realistic portrayal of, of someone who's an extremely misleading uh, politician, maybe that would change. But I think the answer is we don't yet know. Now, to steer a whole nation, uh, let's say, into uh, a, a misbelief uh, takes a very skilled, maybe, team or experts, very professional people, and I guess they would be behind top politicians. Um, but I'm wondering, um, is there also a, a group that is, well, it won't be equally well-funded, like your group is not well-funded, I presume. Uh, even the big newspapers you were mentioning, and the Toronto Star, which is one that I get, uh, I like it. Uh, it's my preferred paper, and I still read the paper version. And I see all these corrections uh, by one of the reporters on, on Trump. But uh, still, it's, um, it just seems to me that uh, there's such a power behind this misinformation at the top political levels that even you guys can't counteract it, find out who's doing it, for sure. I, I would agree with you, like until we, um, one of the questions that I've had since we started in 2015 that I still haven't, I don't have an answer to and I haven't seen an answer is how do we, how do we raise the costs of misinformation? So until we make it more costly for a politician in terms of their reputational impacts and just, you know, it, whatever might be considered as a cost for them, and until we understand that calculation, I don't know that I don't know that the deterrent effect um, is going to be borne out. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for your question, but it's a good one. Hi. Um, I'm Jurid and I am Norwegian. Uh, so I was just browsing factisk.no now as we were speaking, and I looked at um, the facts that had been checked there, and I saw that most of the politicians that haven't gotten feedbacks that their facts were facts, actually, they have corrected themselves. But there were also a lot of um, wrong information from online magazines and web pages, and what I saw there was most of them did not reply, did not, fa did not correct themselves. So the politicians, at least in the Norwegian context, they do respond to this, but other sources do not, um, yeah. Just very quickly, did you know about Factisk beforehand? Oh, good, 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 okay, good. Um, so this is really, again, promising, like you're saying, that the politicians um, are able to correct, but yeah, in terms of whether or not um, other media outlets do, I don't have um, like a, I can't cite anything that's, you know, kind of points to whether or not they're more likely to and, and what ma might make them more likely to. But one strategy that I've seen that has been really effective in the United Kingdom, like full fact, they're, they're quite a good resource team and they actually have dedicated, I think it's a team of two on, so on their fuller staff, they've got two full-time staffers dedicating to chasing misinformation and getting, that, getting things retracted and corrected. So I think that, for instance, is an excellent strategy. Like we know just, in, I'm not trying to 
excuse anyone in the media, uh, you know, for, for keeping something up that might be misinformation, but we, we do know that there are limited resources um, across different newspapers and, you know, and just online content takes people power to, to correct and update. So having a dedicated team has actually been really useful in the U United Kingdom for not only kind of chasing politicians and not kind of, you know, in the nicest way, getting them into a corner and getting them to retract, but also doing the same thing, whether it's like, um, like full fact goes after, uh, like, charities and nonprofits who release different like statements and news releases and studies and that kind of thing and gets everyone to kind of uh, correct what they've put up online. So that's one strategy. I have a question at the end of this, but at a related conference, we had a speaker from a society of professional journalists who was trying to make some kind of cooperation with the Wikimedia world to certify that journalists or journalistic organizations were doing fact checking, were reliable sources, not just to have a conversation about it, maybe statistics about it. And here too, it seems like there could be a cooperation with the MediaWiki platforms or the other network of issues that whether a fact is true is associated with who said it, did the journalist check it, is that journalist at an institution that does checking. So broadly, I wonder if your organization is likely to cooperate or network with Wikimedia or other organizations of this kind, like professional journalist associations. Yeah, definitely. So thank you for that question. Um, the it doesn't matter. That one of the slides that I had on here, which was that code of principles, which was five different kind of you know high level, but more it goes into more detail. Um, these are principles that, um, I, I didn't explain the process well, but there, there is a full process behind verifying fact-checking outlets that are signatories to this code. Um, so there, 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 there is a structure behind this in terms of independent um, verifiers going in and actually checking out every individual organization that applies to be a public signatory to the code of principles. So this is one way that, yes, there is a, a formal way to verify. Uh, and can I envision cooperation, you know, with a partner like Wikipedia and, and you know, affiliates? Absolutely. This has already been happening with, um, I, I haven't given them an, enough credit. I'm more than happy to, we're running out of time, but talk to anyone who wants to know more about what some of the things that Facebook, Google, and others are doing. Google, for instance, has um, been piloting, uh, they've just recently expanded their pilot outside of the U.S., but they've been um, partnering with the uh, International Fact Checking Network and actually any of the verified, um, signatories onto this code of principles um, can now be tagged on Google as a fact checker. And what they've also been doing is um, flagging content that has been uh, challenged by one of these verified fact checkers. And Google is also, so a few different things, but including the elevate fact checks. So if someone types in um, Cotter payout, Facts can will be one of you know the the elevated um, sources on there, and we're we're tagged as a fact checker. So yeah, that type of collaboration is definitely happening, and I think it needs to happen more and more. So uh, I think we're maybe if there's like a one more question. There's also someone who has not uh, asked a question yet, just to be equal opportunity. <laughs> maybe you can, you can we can chat afterwards. Do we see a cultural shift in the West where facts are being seen as less important in a culture and we're aligning ourselves more as a culture with the African adage that relationships are more important and facts can, can bend to suit it? I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um. So, so is is fact-checking inherently a, a cultural and political position on its own? Because some cultures do not value fact-checking. For example, like some, some sub-Saharan African cultures and some East Asian cultures consider relationships more important than, than, than facts. Are we, as Western world, moving towards that direction? Or is it just a blip that we need a lot of fact-checking because politics is, is weird as of these few years? I, 
would be interested in seeing any research that you have to back that up because I, I haven't myself seen anything that says that one culture is more likely to be influenced by facts or not. I think intuitively I could maybe see that the presentation um, of facts and how um, authority is challenged certainly would be different across cultures, but um, I can tell you there are very active colleagues of ours fact-checking. Like in South Africa, there's a big outlet, Africa Check, and Japan has uh, a lot of their news outlets are piloting fact-checking operations right now. So it is something that really is taking off like globally. I think a lot of my um, examples here are, are we're certainly biased to certain parts of the world, and that's my, my blind spot and just where, where my closer colleagues are to pull examples from. But if you do have any sources like that, I'd be interested in seeing them afterwards. So anyways, with that, I think we have to wrap up because we're in plenary right now. But thank you so much, everyone, for your time and, and excellent questions. And please do be in touch.